a special presentation with, for you today. Um, okay, thank you. I see the screen is, is loading up. Um, for you today around the topic of pronouns and honorifics. And so um, I'm reached out across campus to see who really could give us good information. Um, thank you. Uh, good information on this topic because it became very clear to me um, actually last year, but even more poignantly clear this year at the beginning of this year, that there's not a full understanding about the use of pronouns, even, even for myself. And I was very candid with Z when she and I had our initial conversation. Um, you know, I grew up um, in a very binary tradition, so understandings of the need to um, inform uh, people about pronouns was, was new to me on some levels, and, and I just really didn't get it. So my attitude is always from a point of curiosity. I want to grow, and in my growing, I want to grow in understanding. So that's what was the impetus, obviously, for reaching out to Z and to Javier. They are going to speak to us today on the power of identification, the historical, social, and political context of pronouns. And with that, I want to welcome you both and um, say that we're just excited to have you and the audience that we have here has been anxiously awaiting this conversation. So I'm gonna close my mouth and let you take it away. And if there's time at the end, we'll entertain any questions from the audience. Otherwise, I'll sort of monitor the chat and feel the need. If I have to interrupt, I will, but rather I'd rather you finish your presentation and then we engage the audience appropriately from there. So welcome Zitini and Javier Ramirez um, on the topic of the power of identification. Um, thanks so much for having us. Um, we're very excited for this for this talk. Uh, real quickly, and then we'll get right into content. My name is Z Tenney. Um, you might have also seen me previously uh, listed on my work as Lena Tenney, so that's a recent name change for me. Um, I strongly prefer Z, but uh, especially those folks who have known me for years and years, um, if someone calls me Lena, I'm not offended by that. Um, just so folks know. Um, my pronouns are they, them, theirs. Uh, please feel free to just call me Z, uh, but in terms of an honorific, if you'd like, like to be a little more formal, uh, you can feel free to use mix, which is how the MX dot is pronounced. It is simply a gender neutral alternative to the whole like Mr., Miss, Mrs., Ms., Doctor, uh, etc. list. Um, and I'm very happy to be co-presenting uh, with a fellow University of Oklahoma alum here today. Yeah, um, this is so exciting. Uh, my name is Javier Ramirez. I am a second year master's student in the Higher Education Student Affairs Program. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his, and I use Mr. Ramirez as my honorific. Um, and welcome everybody. Um, I guess we'll go ahead and just get into it. Um, so first we're gonna go through a little refresher of what pronouns are again, um, so we can set the stage uh, for the rest of our time together. I think it was the next slide. Sorry. Excellent. So I want to invite folks to think about the last time you had an explicit discussion about pronouns. And it very well might have been when you were a young child learning whatever your primary language is. Uh, or it might be if you were learning a second or third or however many language um, and you needed to learn about pronouns again, uh, but in a different language. For many folks, especially those who identify as cisgender, um, and cisgender is simply the identifier for folks who do not identify as transgender. Um, and we are seeing that term uh, much more broadly known in recent years. Um, so for folks who have not had to, you know, really grapple, grapple with questions about their gender identity and, and expression and what pronouns they want to use, um, pronouns might be really an afterthought for a lot of folks. Um, people might perceive you, whether that's, um, through vision, through sound, uh, and they just make their automatic assumptions and begin to refer to you using he or she. That's pretty a pretty common experience. What we're finding in recent years 
is led primarily by the youths uh, who are doing, the kids are all right, uh, I'm learning from them every day, uh, that having these explicit conversations about pronouns is really helpful for a lot of folks, not only folks who are transgender, which is our focus today, um, but for many folks just in general. Um, so some of the history here is that, uh, again, these things are uh, often an afterthought for folks um, because they happen so early in life, but that when we're talking about pronouns, it's not actually something new. Um, and we're, we're well aware that many, many languages, including English, are highly gendered in the way that they do grammar and just conversational um, speech in general. Um, they're very binary, uh, using a term that Dr. Beard mentioned, right? This idea that everything is in black and white, everything is male and female. Um, and we don't have, uh, the scope of this presentation is not broad enough to go in into an entire rant about the white supremacist white supremacist colonialist history of a binary gender system that does not leave any space for any other expressions, whereas many indigenous cultures throughout uh, many, many centuries have had very different gender systems that are much more expansive and welcoming and affirming than a simple male-female binary. Um, but I wouldn't be a good DEI educator if I didn't manage to slip in that rant uh, while we're here together. Um, another note in terms of historical patterns is that language is constantly evolving which I'm sure you all know, uh, but we don't always have that conversation explicitly. A few examples that are happening in recent dec decades, for example, we see that uh, part of the women's movement here in the United States was challenging this idea of masculine as the default in every space, including in language. So the movement away from things like firefighter, uh, uh, or from fireman to firefighter, right? Like that actually was a very intentional language shift um, that for folks who are my age, we just often take for granted. Um, but thank you for those who, who made that possible. Similar with the singular they, just a very brief history, and there's a link below if you're interested in learning more. Um, this is one of the biggest questions that I get, not only because I use they pronouns, uh, but because folks often have questions uh, about grammar, right? That they're like, you know, the heart is willing, but I was taught by my English teacher who was very strict that they is only if there are multiple people, right? Um, so historically, that's not actually the case. Um, Shakespeare and Chaucer actually use the singular they. It used to be quite normalized and popular, um, and language has shifted, similarly to how we didn't used to have a singular you um, as well, but now we use that all the time without thinking about it. Um, that also includes, uh, I'm just going to mention the term here and then we'll explain a bit later, neo-pronouns, which is essentially the creation of new pronouns within an existing language and any self-identification terms, those always shift throughout the ages. Um, as a really brief uh, refresher or reminder, uh, we can't get into too much trans terminology, but for example, the shift in the last couple of decades away from terms such as transsexual and towards terms like transgender, where it's like, well, if you, hadn't, if you haven't had a refresher on this in like two or three decades, uh, you might not be familiar with the most uh, common terminology that is used by folks these days. And just as a reminder, and I'm sure many of you have seen this in your life, uh, lived experiences and research, uh, is that we often see this pattern on the policy side in particular and in politics in which American society in particular likes to focus on what I'm going to call proxy issues. So pronouns uh, are popular. They're a hot topic right now in DEI spaces, largely because of a massive conservative backlash against transgender people and our humanity. So the issue isn't necessarily pronouns, right? It can't be reduced to something quite so simple. Um, this is actually about whether or not trans people are fully affirmed in our humanity and allowed to live our lives uh, in the ways that everyone should be able to. Um, but again, this is where we're getting these fights about pronouns. We're having things like big debates around the Dave Chappelle special and folks who are people of color and trans and pregnant getting fired for protesting, whereas white colleagues who are cisgender are simply getting suspended, right? All of these larger inequalities uh, come to bear and are the context we're inheriting. So as a reminder about our little English grammar, uh, here's a list of some pronouns. Pronouns are just any, any words that replace nouns. So people don't constantly say, well, Z is wearing a fabulous sweater, Z's hair is on fleek today. Uh, they might say their sweater is great, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because we don't just constantly use people's names over and over typically in our speech patterns. 
And so for those of us who love a good chart with some syntax rules, uh, here we have a few examples for some of the more common pronouns we use when uh, communicating. Um, but it's also imperative to remember that these are not the only pronouns to exist, as you know, they are a social construction. Um, so just like we were talking about with neo pronouns, um, new ones are emerging regularly, especially as the language continues to evolve. Um, and so the ones that I want to focus on here um, are the they, them, and Z here, and Z, Z here ones. Um, so we have the subjective, objective, possessive, and reflexive um, versions of the pronouns. And so ones that I feel like individuals typically um, struggle with is when we are going outside of the um, she, he, they pronouns and going into the Z, here, and zir. Um, so for example, I listen to here. Um, uh, the backpack is years. Um, I understand that this may be a little bit of uh, a language switch um, for some individuals, but these are the different ways that um, folks are wanting to identify as because, you know, the binary just does not work for everybody. Um, and that is completely okay. So just a little syntax chart. Um, thank you to the next one. <clears throat> and so we already know how to use a singular they. Um, I feel like one of the more common examples of how uh, individuals kind of uh, have gotten around using singular they is using, oh no, someone left uh, his or her cell phone. Um, but this shows the lack of making assumptions on gender. However, it does disregard the folks who are denied here uh, to the binary and especially not um, the he, him, or she, her pronouns. Um, so we have, uh, dang, I wonder if they'll miss it. Of course, they will. It's their phone. Um, so these are just some of the examples of how our language is already set up to use they, them pronouns. Thank you. Um, and the listing of for Z in here, for example, those are neo pronouns. So they uh, have emerged in recent decades um, as a different or alternate, alternate pronoun. We can't go into the whole history there, but suffice it to say uh, that uh, they're all valid and they tend to come from different sort of political tax or approaches. Um, so folks who might identify as non-binary, gender, queer, agender, the list goes on, who might use these different pronouns, um, that there is some train of thought of like, well, um, let's go ahead and create something new for our use, right? Um, we're going to do things differently, um, you know, fresh new beginnings that aren't rooted in all of these systems of oppression, et cetera, et cetera. Um, whereas they is really uh, bringing something back from the past that has already existed and renormalizing it. Um, so you can't tell someone's politics from what pronouns they use, certainly, um, but just for those who are curious, um, that's some of the context about uh, neo pronouns and why they tend to be a little bit more rare. Um, for example, in a perfect world, I would probably use neo pronouns, but I'm also like a realist and recognize that people struggle with singular they pronouns enough um, for me that I don't want to have to deal with explaining neo pronouns because I'm tired uh, and my gender identity right now is tired. Uh, so um, some of these are really practical questions that trans folks and folks who are exploring their identity um, really have to navigate. So that's part of why this is so complicated. The great thing is it's not complicated for how to use other people's pronouns because all you have to do is believe them when they tell you who they are. Um, that's the great thing is just reflect back to people who they uh, know themselves to be and that you don't have to be an expert on everything to do with gender uh, in order to provide basic human respect and affirmation um, to folks who might share their pronoun or names or honorifics. Um, also, I forgot earlier, I just want to do a quick shout out to actually a colleague on the call, Dr. Leo Taylor, um, who is in CFAES. Um, him and I uh, piloted this particular presentation some months ago um, with some similar, although not the same content, um, and just wanted to shout out, shout out Dr. Taylor's contribution to this um, as he is uh, here on the call as well. Um, and also recognize there's a number of folks on this call with plenty of expertise. Please feel free uh, to share your thoughts and, uh, and whatnot in the chat, not only questions. 
Uh, so another common question that folks will ask is, well, you know, I've been seeing a lot of people, you know, put their pronouns in their email signature or introduce themselves by name in student organizations, for example. Uh, and every once in a while, uh, or pretty frequently, someone will tell me two different pronouns, and I'm not sure what to do with that. So here's the lowdown on that. So for some folks, uh, they might say, hi, uh, I'm so-and-so and I use she, they pronouns. What that means typically is that the person uh, feels affirmed by both she, her, hers, and they, them, theirs. And the invitation, usually when someone's doing a, uh, a both and or two sets, uh, is to use them interchangeably. It's really easy for our minds that have been colonized into a binary gender system to simply default to the gendered pronoun that we think matches the person's presentation or appearance. Uh, a lot of my friends use she, they pronouns or he, they pronouns. Um, and one of the like minor irritants uh, in the grand scheme, but still irritating, is that people, they'll say that and people only use he or only use she. So just go ahead and switch it up. Um, it's a great way to help folks feel seen. Um, there are also a number of folks, and this is really, really growing uh, with young folks, is the idea of any pronouns with respect. So many uh, of the folks who are, you know, first year students and who are coming to OSU, um, actually I was recently at a, at a student event um, and almost half the table I was sitting with of students um, they didn't put on a pronoun pin because they don't have a pronoun preference. They do not care how people refer to them. Um, so we need to just up our game at OSU and get some of those. But the idea of I'm a person, I'm a human, and I really don't care how you refer to me as long as it's respectful. Um, and I know a number of folks who use any pronouns, including some elders um, who have really embraced this idea of like, why is everything gendered anyway? Um, and some folks use no pronouns. This is a little bit more rare, but still, of course, valid. Um, and folks oftentimes will say what to use instead of pronouns. So someone might say, you know, my name is so-and-so, um, please don't use pronouns to refer to me, simply use my name. So in that case, it might feel, uh, you might feel a little grinding to a halt in your brain of like, how do I do that? Because I'm so trained to simply use pronouns over and over. Um, you have to do it consciously, but just a reminder, uh, if that is what someone wants, go ahead and reflect it back to them. Um, so if I said I'm Z and I use no pronouns, please use my name, then, then you would use the pattern of Z's sweater is amazing, um, Z's hair looks great, as opposed to using a pronoun, right? Um, a couple of things to consider uh, when folks are, are using multiple pronouns. Um, one is this idea of allyship. So oftentimes folks who are cisgender and striving to be supportive of transgender students, peers, colleagues, friends, grandkids, whoever it might be, is, um, you know, I hear that normalizing pronouns is the big thing right, near for, right now for allies, uh, especially they, them, since there's this big fight about whether it's grammatically correct. So like, is it culturally appropriative for me to start using she, they pronouns as like a sign of solidarity? If you ask 10 trans people, you'll probably get 12 different answers. <laughs> so um, proceed with caution, right? But generally, um, I would say typically within the community, the, the majority of folks say, yes, when it's used as an intentional act of allyship, then please do that. Um, because I know from my experience and part of why I um, finally found the space to use they them pronouns uh, was folks normalizing that conversation. Um, and that way, when you send an email and someone responds with like, I see you have pronouns in your email signature, uh, like I don't really understand what that means, that as a cisgender ally, uh, you can go ahead and pitch in and have that educational conversation in a way that does not include the emotional burden that trans people have uh, have to deal with because we're explaining pronouns like 50 times a day. Um, and I unfortunately do not get a bonus uh, every time I do that at my job, right? Um, so please feel free to do that if you're doing it in solidarity. Um, you're not co-opting they pronouns in my humble opinion. Um, for some folks, multiple sets of pronouns might be an act of exploration of self-identity and expression. This is super common where folks might say, well, my pronouns are, are he, they. And it might start as an allyship thing. And then folks might be like, ooh, I really like it when people call me they. I didn't know because no one had ever done it before, but I'm kind of digging this, like this feels good on me. Um, and then they might switch it to they, he. Oftentimes when it's more than one set of pronouns, whichever one comes first tends to be the one that is slightly more preferred. 
That's not universal though. Um, and fluidity. So there are folks who might not use uh, the same pronouns in every single space or throughout their lifetime. And that's all about growth and development, not the idea that it's some kind of a phase. Um, so uh, there are also folks, for example, some folks who are bi-gender who really view themselves as both masculine and feminine, and that it might depend on the day or the space they're in, how they're really uh, feeling that that day. Oftentimes we'll say which, which pronouns they're using right now in this space or this conversation. Um, so that leaves room for fluidity for how people want to express themselves. So uh, if someone changes their pronouns, just go with it. Um, even if you have a student in one class uh, saying that they use she, her pronouns, and then you happen to see them at an LGBTQ event and they introduce themselves with they, them pronouns, uh, it's usually safe to check in and just say, hey, I just know in class you're using these pronouns. Um, I just want to make sure I'm using the right pronouns for you. And it's very possible that it could be place specific because as anyone with marginalized identities knows, not every space is safe. In fact, no spaces are truly safe. Um, and folks might have more space for, for fluidity, exploration, and authenticity in spaces that are structurally more safe, such as an LGBTQ student gathering, um, where they know people are not going to uh, make fun of them or ask weird invasive questions about their bodies if they say their pronouns are they. And they might intentionally be using she pronouns in a classroom where they don't know people. Right, so there's the difference uh, right there. Uh, and another really common question is like, okay, isn't this all kind of silly? They're just words. Like, why does it matter so much? Why does it matter if I misgender someone on accident? What's the big deal? Because, you know, sticks and stones and all of that. Um, but the reality is, uh, we're going to look at some research here. Um, uh, words have always been a big deal. They're how we construct our realities and how we commu communicate with one another. Pronouns are no different. Um, so for folks who might be particularly focused on K-12 spaces, and also for those of us who work in higher ed and we are sort of inheriting students from these systems, um, here's just a little bit of data. Um, there's a, quite a bit out there. Uh, reflecting some of the experiences of trans youth. Um, and this generation that's coming up, Gen Z, or X, like, hold on, what am I? I don't know, the youths uh, is how I should jokingly always say it. Uh, I was recently called a boomer by one of the youths and it was really hilarious. It was great uh, at age 30. Uh, but <laughs> uh, suffice it to say that the data shows that experiences of things like harassment, and physical assault and sexual violence are not rare for trans kids, including in educational spaces. So that might blow some people's minds if you're just not familiar with the issue, if you don't have a trans uh, nephew or niece, um, nibbling is the gender inclusive uh, version of those words. Um, but the reality is that it's pretty darn common. Um, and we also find from research that teachers are often, teachers and school administrators are often reported by trans kids as the main perpetuators of these kinds of things, including physical assault. Um, and you have likely seen stories in the news, largely around bathroom spaces, um, because that is a current battleground um, for us politically, um, in which we have had, you know, a, a principal walk in on a trans boy in the boys' room, and the principal told him, um, well, go ahead and pee in front of me, like, whip it out, and I'll tell you if you're a real boy, right? Like, that kind of stuff is not rare, but that one time it made the news. Um, and, you know, anyone who's been to middle school would probably say attending school is the most traumatic part of growing up, but for trans kids that's compounded on, compounded on top of a typical experience around finding oneself an identity, um, as well as things like bullying and harassment um, and cyberbullying, um, which is a, a whole nother arena where trans kids can experience a lot of violence. Um, and this doesn't just go away magically when we come into the wonderful ivory tower <laughs> of higher education. Um, these things persist for a lot of our students, um, as well as faculty and staff, certainly. Um, it's, just, it's just not uncommon, um, is the takeaway from this. Can I interrupt for just a minute, Z? Um, I'm trying to capture the um, 
citations you have at the bottom of your slides to put in the chat and I'm not able to they didn't the first one didn't appear like on Google Scholar so when you're finished if you'll make those available in the chat that'd be great absolutely and I uh, Javi and I can make sure to send a copy of these slides and many of them are hyperlinked not all the studies because of paywalls and all that kind of stuff that's perfect um, thank you but yeah those can go to attendees Z, I don't know if this is the most up-to-date information on this particular slide. I might have forgotten to delete it, so we're proceeding. <laughs> so I have uh, I have things to say on the College of Environments um, slide, though, um, that I can go ahead and share, and then we can give the updated, most updated version um, and share it out with everybody. So um, I will be sure to share out the citations. Um, but it's particularly for uh, college environments, um, there was a survey that was done at over 71 colleges and universities um, with data that showed the use of gender inclusive language, as well as gender affirming policies and practices contributed to a much better holistic environment um, for folks with, as they put, gender minority. But um, I would like to switch that up and be with minoritized uh, gender identities, specifically those um, with whose gender did not align with the one assigned at birth. Um, additionally, the survey also revealed concerning statistics such as over three-fourths of trans college students experiencing one or more mental health problems such as depression, anxiety, eating disorders, self-injury, um, and suicidal ideation. Um, so it is important to note that these are not directly because of their minoritized identities, but rather because of the systems in place that are transphobic and lack affirming qualities that in turn create those hostile environments that are detrimental to the well-being of effective student of affected students or individuals. And then it went into the mental health one. That is where we went. If I could work in a computer, that would help. I don't know why it's not going backwards. Okay. <laughs> uh, so this is, you know, pretty common uh, across various identities, um, but this is particularly important to note because LGBTQ people have been so pathologized and medicalized over the years. There's a whole set of, of history there as well, uh, essentially in, in which healthcare professions, including mental health, have set up these massive barriers to care. Um, and that you have to prove your transness repeatedly in order to access any kind of um, care. And that is while folks are facing things like a record number in 2021, um, by far, of state legislation uh, pieces being proposed and passed that target trans youth. Um, here in Ohio, uh, the SAFE, S-A-F-E, um, which is, uh, a lot, lot to say about that name being chosen. The SAFE Act here in Ohio was just proposed uh, in the House, I believe, um, and it would ban trans youth uh, from accessing gender affirming care uh, and would criminalize providers. I'm in the College of Pharmacy, so this is a big concern for us, uh, would actually uh, potentially criminalize providers for providing the affirming care that literally saves the lives of trans children. Um, so when we say that using proper pronouns that people have uh, expressed to you is important, we're literally talking about the easiest possible suicide prevention strategy, like, ever, um, because of that data that Javi was sharing, um, in which, you know, affirmation really is life-saving for kids, um, and I see that all the time. Um, please feel free to join your friendly local protest on Saturday against the SAFE Act. Uh, it'll be at the State House at 3 p.m. and feel free to, to message me if you need details. <laughs> yes, uh, exactly what you just said. Um, so the whole concept of like being called out and called in, this is one of my favorite things that I learned um, from my time at the University of Oklahoma, um, that the Gender and Equality Center um, was very adamant about um, teaching in um, some of the workshops. Um, so <clears throat> in the instance of pronouns accidentally being assumed or used incorrectly, it is important to acknowledge um, individual preferences for what to do when a mistake happens. So what happens when a mistake is made? Well, let's look at claim. Um, so first, you know, centering yourself, um, you are not the, you are not in 
harm's way, you're not being attacked. Um, remember that you're a good person and this is a learning moment um, that we all have gone through at one point or another. Um, but this is particularly about you know, your behaviors and um, stopping the assumptions uh, that we have been socialized and trained to make. Um, and secondly, listen. Um, this is a really big one. Uh, so if you've read Robin D'Angelo's White Fragility, it talks about the different types of um, responses that people have when they are presented with information that they do not have the stamina and endurance to be able to handle. Um, and so when we um, are being um, addressed for our behaviors and what we said, um, making sure that you're not interrupting and trying to defend your actions, trying to make excuses, just own it, um, which goes into the next one, acknowledging um, and apologizing. And so a form of apology that you can make is just not making the mistake again. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it can also be hard and difficult um, and may take a couple of times, but I have faith that we can all do it. <laughs> um, and so the next one, uh, the reason why it's in parentheses is inquire. Um, it should never be the job or responsibility of the individual who the harm or trauma was done on to, to be the one to educate you. That is unpaid labor that you are asking them to do. So maybe asking if they have the capacity to do so um, would be beneficial, but this is a great time for individuals to um, take time to educate themselves. There are plenty of resources um, available um, at all of our disposal. Um, so let's use it. So last one, moving forward. Um, like I said earlier, the best apology is, you know, changing the actual behavior, um, making sure that we are addressing um, the, you know, using the wrong um, pronouns and, you know, just unlearning everything that we have been taught to learn. Great. So as we're thinking about paving pathways forward, um, particularly if one of our goals uh, as some level of elders compared to a lot of our incoming students um, is really uh, creating pathways that folks can, can follow uh, and um, normalizing a lot of these conversations, right? Uh, so one, one thing is uh, I often find, especially with trans youth, that if someone accidentally misspeaks and used the incorrect pronoun like um, was being addressed, uh, that folks typically would prefer that you just correct yourself as like when you realize it and move on. Um, so like this is the, uh, my, my mom who, you know, knew me as a certain name and a certain gender for, you know, since before I was born, right? If my mom um, can switch pronouns for me and only occasionally slip and be like, well, she, I mean, they. So that's a great example, right, of just like, I mean, um, and switching it up. And if you don't notice it, um, again, remember the claim model when someone points it out. Um, and it doesn't need to be pointed out in a big deal kind of way, and we don't want our um, sincere apology for causing harm to become more harm. Um, this is a side note, but um, transgender people, there's emerging, re emerging research that shows um, that we are actually statistically more likely um, to be uh, neurodiverse and non-neurotypical. Um, so we see actually a lot of um, uh, autism in folks who are trans, um, a lot of ADHD, that's me. Uh, and, you know, we could talk all day about any kind of reasons of why that's the case. Um, but suffice it to say, a lot of us are anxious because we are already battling this whole thing of people's perceptions versus how we view ourselves. And so when someone makes it this huge deal of like, oh my gosh, Z, I cannot believe that I misgendered you again. That's like the 10th time this week. And I misgendered you the other day on the phone when you weren't there. Well, then now I'm just embarrassed, right? So, so instead just, uh, uh, you know, someone can speak up and say like, oh, just as a reminder, these pronouns are they, them. And I'm like, solid. Like, that is the best allyship that I could ask for is just like a really casual, friendly reminder, um, especially in the workplace where I will be misperceived as the angry trans person if someone is like calling out misgendering on my behalf. Um, very noble intentions and not necessarily the impact that we are looking for. All right. So, uh, here are some scripts where, you know, if we were all together in person, we could, 
you know, go around the table <laughs> and, and practice. But here are some ways just to get used to introducing yourself with your pronouns. Um, because uh, if you are cisgender and people correctly gender you just based off of their perception, it might not occur to you, but it's really great to just always introduce yourself with your pronouns as you feel confident and comfortable. Um, I do want to take a moment, um, one of the big debates right now is whether uh, listing of pronouns should be mandatory. Um, and personally, as an educator uh, and thinking about like student development and identity development, I don't think it should ever be mandatory because you don't know what someone's uh, identity is or where they're at in exploration. Um, so, for example, there are some people who are trans who pass the idea that, um, you know, no one would look at them and be like, oh, I bet that person's trans, right? People correctly gender them pretty much 100% of the time. Folks don't always want to reveal their trans identity. Um, and sometimes introducing oneself with one's pronouns can seem like uh, sort of like, a little dog whistle where sometimes folks will pick up and be like, I bet that person is trans because they're sharing their pronouns. We're seeing less of that, that as this becomes more normalized. But even here at Ohio State, where we think that we're like relatively progressive, um, it is not uncommon for me to be the only person and sometimes the only DEI practitioner uh, in the room who introduces myself with my pronouns, right? So I'm just automatically outing myself um, because I use uh, non-normative pronouns, right? Um, so just introducing yourself and inviting people in to use their pronouns, but never putting someone on the spot and being like, why didn't you share your pronouns? They could be closeted. They might not be ready to share what pronouns they want to use. Um, they might be a first year student who's never had this conversation and is very lost as to what is happening on the first day of class when people are sharing their pronouns, right? Um, and we want to make sure that we give grace and space to those folks as well. Um, so if you're facilitating facilitating spaces, whether that's teaching um, student organizations, running staff meetings, whatever it is, um, that you can lead with your example and invite people to come along on the journey, um, but that it should not be compulsory. Um, and it can be really helpful to just quickly explain just it can be as simple as, you know, I'm sharing my name and my pronouns um, just, you know, out of solidarity with trans folks in particular, but but really just to normalize this conversation that, that we should be able to articulate our identities and how we want people to refer to us um, so that it gives people the chance to um, be accurate in how they speak about us. That really is a very good point, and thank you for bringing that out, um, especially even on this call and, and part of the reason that I really wanted to have this conversation. Um, I didn't get why it would be necessary for me to include my pronouns and what did that signal. So the allyship or even the safe space conversation um, is very helpful, I think, overall, just in, in communicating, you know, uh, generally and, and, and introducing myself through in, use, in the use of my pronouns. Thank you. Absolutely. These are just a couple of examples of ways that we can embed this um, and that OSU um, has been embedding it more structurally so that it becomes more common. Um, so here's, you know, my up to date <laughs> email signature. Right. Um, so this is actually uh, there's a whole history and you can link to it here um, and you can go generate your official like uh, signed off on the brand. We know OSU, uh, the OSU loves its branding, right? So it was actually kind of a big deal for OSU to actually uh, approve for pronouns and honorifics to officially be included um, in things like business cards um, and email signatures. So these are just some examples of what that can look like, uh, whether you're at OSU or somewhere else. Um, with the business cards, uh, since I just reordered um, with my new position and new name, uh, there's not currently a line built in for it for those of us who might be staff who, who do those kinds of things um, for ourselves or others, um, but you can just write it in and they will do it. Um, I will say that uh, trans folks who uh, see email signatures and business cards that have pronouns on them, um, I always notice that. Um, and it always tells me this person is at least like a bit more aware on these issues, right? We're not expecting anyone to be perfect, but it's a really good signifier that someone might be a safer space. Um, so I really encourage um, for that reason to, to start including those if you haven't already. Um, and some of these other virtual spaces, um, Carmen Zoom now officially has pronouns where you can uh, adjust that in your profile. It does not allow for more than one set of pronouns. Um, and uh, I know that that's an issue that some students have mentioned. 
um, but you can have uh, something designated. You can also type it in. So it could be depending on the meeting, you may or may not want your pronouns in your name on Zoom. Again, knowing about spaces and how they feel. And so, you know, what do we do in other spaces, um, such as like social media, where we're there to like, you know, keep up with the current news, uh, see what all our friends and family are doing. Um, what's really good is they have the space on some social media, such as um, Instagram with, you know, Demi Lovato and Billy Porter able to put their pronouns um, directly next to their names. Um, and then I've seen individuals on Twitter um, like with Elliot Page, do it in their bio um, or have their name. So it would be like Elliot Page, uh, parentheses, he, they. Um, I have mine in my bio. Um, what's even interesting is considering like more professional kind of social media such as LinkedIn, LinkedIn even has an option. Um, I remember putting it down, but I can't really find it on people's profiles yet. Maybe I just need to look in a better place. Um, but yeah, these are some ex um, some examples of how we're starting to see this become more common in uh, both in all spaces, both physically and virtually. Um, and also looking at like you know when we're starting the semester, um, how do educators or even you know um, employers when they hire on folks, how do we learn more about the people that we're going to be working with? Um, and so for like an introduction kind of icebreaker kind of activity, um, something that you could do is the name you go by. So your chosen name as opposed to um, some spaces that um, are not as, you know, up to date with uh, what's going on um, that may ask to go by your like legal official name, uh, not not legal official name, your legal name, which could also be someone's dead name. Um, Z, would you like to go over what, a, did we already go over a dead name already? We had not mentioned that. So yeah. Um, so a dead name is a term that trans folks tend to use for usually a name given at birth or uh, most importantly, what is legally recorded as your name and or gender. Um, and the origin of that is basically the idea of uh, if you were to die today, uh, what name is going to be reported in the newspaper? Um, and this is a huge issue where people get dead named in newspapers constantly, um, and that trans uh, folks, particularly trans uh, women of color, most specifically Black trans women, um, the murder date, murder rate in the U.S. and worldwide is astronomical um, and very disproportionate. And then even in death, there's no respect given and uh, newspapers will use a legal name or a dead name um, when that is not who they are or were. Yeah, and so this is where we get the name you go by. So this is the one where, you know, this will be the name that you'll be referred to as. Um, and so a way that they sometimes may ask for like a death name may be like the name on roster. What are you going to officially show up as? Um, and so some institutions, some spaces are very great about this and making that transition and not using it. Um, but it still is something that happens. Um, and so then this is also a perfect place for you to get the pronouns for um, everybody. Um, and then this next one, great one, where you call home. Um, someone's physical like birthplace may not be a space that they truly associate with what feels like home to them. Um, so where you call home is a great way to figure to ask um, what, you know, is, you know, a safe, comfortable place uh, where this person feels like they are at home. Um, and then... The uh, next two lines are your typical year in school, majors, minors, anything else you'd like to know. Um, and so something that's really great um, is pronoun pins. So uh, I work here in the Multicultural Center in my assistantship. Um, so something that's great that we have, um, and then the ones pictured are from Equitas, but we have pronoun pins here. Um, so this is a great way to wear um, especially if you're like, you know, really new with trying to get acclimated to um, asking folks for like pronouns or introducing with pronouns, this can be an even easier way to display how you would like to be referred to, uh, what pronouns you would like to use. Um, and so just like the earlier um, slide that Z mentioned with um, multiple, um, multiple pronouns, uh, something that we need to work on um, is starting to incorporate the multiple pronouns um, into the pens. Um, but this would be a great example for 
um, using pronoun pins in everyday use. Another common question, we mentioned like the, the Dave Chappelle special and, and Netflix earlier. Um, so one of the common rhetorics, and, and this, this is a historical pattern, right? This idea of uh, political correctness is the precursor to this idea of cancel culture. Um, whereas what is actually happening is that people are holding other folks accountable for their discriminatory and hurtful and harmful behaviors, right? So I'm a big fan of consequence culture um, <laughs> in which you can expect for there to be consequences if you're going to be racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, etc., right? So there's this big question around like censorship or if I'm forced to use someone's pronouns, um, isn't that an infringement on my rights? Um, I recently saw an article that the person, oh, that's what it was. I can't remember which university, but they released an updated uh, gendered language guide uh, that advised folks to use pronouns that folks have expressed that they use. Um, and it addressed this question and it was like the, the provost or somebody uh, uh, ended off the article by saying something like, you are of course free uh, to choose whether or not to use the pronouns that someone has shared with you. And as a result, will accept the consequences of <laughs> which choice you make um, and basically said, um, similar to how if you were to be rude to your colleague, you would expect for there to be some kind of consequence if you choose to be invalidating and discriminatory to trans students and staff, you can expect for there to be consequences, right? Um, so. There's also this question of like humor and what is or isn't appropriate that that is the constant historical debate of like, well, can, why can't we tell jokes anymore? Um, well, just like we uh, have tried, folks have worked really hard to make racist jokes not acceptable in the workplace or ever. Uh, similarly, uh, folks are trying to do that with all kinds of identities. That doesn't mean that we like can't have a good time or joke about our identity exploration or anything like that. So this is just a quick tip and a reminder. Um, being a social justice warrior doesn't mean we have like no sense of humor or whatever. Um, I saw a meme that said something like, uh, and this is totally my experience about like, oh, you used to be funny. And it's like, no, I used to be actively complicit in my own oppression and dehumanization. And now I don't do that anymore, right? Um, <laughs> so we, we strive. So here's some examples um, where jokes can go awry. Oftentimes the intention might be to be lighthearted um, or to just be goofy. The example here on the right where someone might introduce themselves of like, hi, you know, my pronouns are your majesty. Um, or um, your worship or whatever it might be. So regardless of the intention, the outcome is that trans folks hear that pronouns are not to be taken seriously and that our very identities um, are a joke, right? So if you are not transgender, please don't make those kinds of jokes about pronouns when you're introducing yourself um, because it sends the wrong message. You will sometimes hear trans folks make those kinds of jokes. Um, that is largely because it is our identities that belong to us. So there's some level of like word reclamation and joke reclamation um, going on, right? And sometimes we tease each other about things like going around the circle and saying your pronouns, right? But that's because that is an in-group humor for us, right? Similarly to where white people telling racist jokes is not in-group humor, it's racism, right? Um, a higher profile example from my dearly beloved show, The Mandalorian, um, is, uh, you know, there was consequence culture for Gina Carano um, that she put boop, bop, beep as her pronouns on Twitter making fun of the movement to include pronouns. So again, uh, even if it's an attempt at humor, it's really inappropriate and invalidating um, and microaggressive. Uh, examples of humor that are great about pronouns. Uh, why did the non-binary prosecutor move west in 1849? Because there was gold in the, them their heels. Okay, right, like that is objectively like not harmful. It is not disparaging trans people. Um, this is, you know, joke is gonna be best received coming from a trans person. But I would say like this kind of humor where we're playing on grammar, that's pretty like pretty acceptable, I'd say. Most trans people are just gonna laugh at that and are not gonna have a problem with it. Similar with this uh, Tumblr post to date myself uh, of like what gender you use for chocolate, Hershey. Uh, right, so we're like 
we're making plays on words as opposed to saying this pronoun game is stupid. Um, I'm also just a big fan of using humor as pedagogy in general, so that's part of why I had to include that. Um, but I will hand it on over uh, for our conversation about gender inclusive language uh, going beyond pronouns. Yeah, and so when we look at um, the gender inclusive language that we may or may not use, um, there's some type of, there's some form parts of our language that is very formalized that has always historically been gendered but it doesn't have to be that way. And so, um, you know, when we talk about greeting others, so this is very big, especially for those of us that come from the South, um, saying ma'am and sir and ladies and like, ladies and gentlemen, when you go to a theater, like you expect to hear ladies and gentlemen, but this is language that is not inclusive of other individuals that do not identify as a lady or a gentleman. And so, Another one that's very common is the automatic guys. Like you think of a classic, I mean, what, like an R.L. Stein book when there's like a group of kids trying to figure out what type of horror is about to come on. Um, they are always like, guys, we got to figure this out. And it's like a group of girls. And so like, gender, like gendered language is very inherent and woven into the fabrics of our society. So, you know, let's look at some other ways that we can change our language around. Thanks, friends. Have a great night. Good morning, folks. Folks is a huge one that um, I wonder, MC, not to put you on a spot, can you talk a little bit about folks with the X? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is another issue that you, if you ask 10 trans people, you'll get 12 answers. But uh, basically what we've seen in recent years is some folks spelling some words differently. Um, for example, with an X at the end in order to make it gender inclusive. Um, you've probably uh, seen it as Latinx or Latinx being like the most prominent one. And, and that's hotly debated in, in the Latinx community, certainly. Um, there are some folks who have been spelling folks with an X instead of the KS. And the idea is to uh, signify with language and spelling that this is an inclusive space. Um, there's also plenty of trans folks who say like folks was already gender inclusive, so why do we need that? But if you see it with the X, that is the intention behind it. Thank you so much. Um, and so some other examples, hi everyone. And for you, can I get you all something? And so I think something, especially for Southerners, I just, I feel like respect, respected, respectable language amongst Southern culture is so prominent. And so to think of y'all, even saying y'all is already gender inclusive right there. And so instead of like guys and girls, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, there's even some other versions of ladies and gentle, uh, gentlemen that I've heard, such as like ladies and gentle folks, um, which I think it, as a great transition from the formality of ladies and gentlemen as well. Um, and so, you know, breaking the binary, how can we also keep the same energy of ladies and gentlemen and transition it into um, something else that is inclusive, but also breaking the binary? Um, honored guest, distinguished guest, um, talking about your partners, which I, for in a personal experiences, it always stresses me out because when someone's like, oh, my partner, I'm like, Okay, are they are they one of me? Are they are they an, are they a part of the LGBTQ plus community? And so um, while that is my own like personal game of trying to figure it out, it's also none of my business as well. Um, so girlfriend, boyfriend, partner, date, date friend, date mate, babe friend, babe, heart, person, significant other. These are all great examples of what you could use. Um, and switching over from the guys and ladies, boys and girls, y'all, folks people, guests, um, using the folks with an X. Y'all is a great term that I use every single day. Um, girl, boy, man, woman, think of just using person or human. Add some humanity more to your language, you know? Break the binary, everybody. Absolutely. Uh, and where we sometimes can just uh, not think about it and go on autopilot might be, for example, if you don't know all of your students' names yet, um, 
And you might be tempted to say like, yeah, the girl in the red shirt um, and you know, half the class is gonna answer because it's Ohio State. Uh, but if instead you say the person in the red shirt um, or um, something that doesn't assume a gender, but that folks can still identify who it is you're talking about. Um, and this is part of a whole shift uh, for trans inclusion, including in gendered spaces. Um, so for example, um, in the birthing and doula in uh, world right now, there's a big shift towards folks saying um, pregnant and parenting people as opposed to saying moms because you don't know that everyone who is pregnant or has recently given birth is a mom or identifies as a woman right there are plenty of trans men that have babies uh, for example um, and even thinking about our like printed and online materials that we might have. Um, so when we're talking about like career services and as an aspect of student affairs, for example, it tends to be really, really gendered. And we got to ask that question, like, does this actually need to be gendered or can we get the information across in a way that is more inclusive, right? Um, so it doesn't matter what gender you are, uh, this is considered business casual or business professional if you put it on your body. And so let's look at um, the way that our institutions kind of function uh, for students. And so um, this was a great friend of mine, Leanne Ho from the University of Oklahoma. Um, we graduated at the same time. Something that I am so honored to know them for is the way that they really changed the like landscape of Oklahoma with the way that awards and like official campus like functions, the way that they work. And so something that was really great is instead of going from like big man, big woman on campus as like the big awards um, each year, it's now big person on campus. Um, well, something that I also kind of critique with the way the institution structures with that um, is the way that they still, if there's not a candidate in the candidate pool that year that is um, trans or um, non-binary, they still tend to kind of pick one woman and one man, which is, you know, it doesn't always have to be that. Um, and the likelihood of it happening is still pretty high. Um, but this also goes into the next slide uh, for the next point of homecoming court. Um, so instead of being homecoming king, homecoming queen, transitioning to homecoming royalty. Um, so something that uh, not only this individual, um, but uh, Leanne um, both did, um, is homecoming court now had no strict six, um, six men, six women, but rather a gender inclusive like group of individuals. Um, so did homecoming court need to be gendered in the first place? I don't think so. Yeah. And for, from a personal note, my last desperate attempt to fit into femininity really uh, was being on homecoming court when I was in college, which it was just incredibly gendered. Um, and that dress was great, but it's not me. Um, and that's something that I still like think about and remember in my experience is how gendered it was and how uncomfortable I was the whole time it was supposed to be like a celebration of student success, right? So it can really affect the way that students experience even the most celebratory aspects of their college experience. Um, I wanted to uh, address Dr. Penny Pasquay's question um in the chat box um so when latinx colleagues and um, grad students use she her ella and him el um the ella and el and ellos that is in spanish um so when we talk about like actually i'm not gonna lie i'm not completely fluent in spanish so i'm not about to come up with a sentence off the top of my head um but the el um ella ellos and then there's like I'm pretty sure they threw an X in there for the gender neutral version of um, it, but um, yes. So this is just the inclusion of their cultural background um, as being uh, bilingual or multilingual um, Spanish speakers. Um, if you, you'll see um, there is a response. Um, the use of AIL has more to do with language emphasizing that we speak both Spanish and English and shift away from English dominance. At least that's how my friends and family have talked about it, perceived it. 
Okay. Just like you mentioned earlier, if y'all are some experts, please input because I definitely do not have all yeah. the information on that. I just know that um, when they include both of them, um, yes, it is to sign uh, signal that Spanish and English are both uh, languages that they use. And there is some hegemonic English going on around here. Okay. Um, it's one o'clock. And so thank you very, very much for this. This was jam packed full of good information and we could go probably another hour. I would, I am interested though, for those folks in the audience who really do have uh, any more questions for Z or Javier, please to bring those forward now so that we could spend a few minutes, these last remaining minutes, um, entertaining what you need in this discussion. This was very fruitful, um, very informative. I very much appreciate um, the, not just the history, but the acceptance and, and uh, perspective of respect, uh, specifically respect for humanity and the dignity that's involved in the one thing that you said that I will take away um, is, what did you say? Uh, how did you, how did you call it? Reflecting back what they, how people identify that, that is very helpful for me. Um, just as I told you earlier, having grown up in a very binary um, understanding, um, just having, you know, the room and the space to allow new perspectives um, is very welcoming. Is there anyone who would like to share anything or speak? Uh, we have maybe four minutes left before the, um, before the call will close out. Any of the participants that is. It's very quiet, but there's a lot of thank you in the chats. <laughs> so they got a lot out of this, especially um, in the conversation. It, this one says, I have some APIDA friends who do similar things with their pronouns in English and their native language for that same reason. I guess it's the pushback away from the English and the respect for their own cultural language, so. We love a good attempt at decolonization. <laughs> Hi, Leo. Is there something you'd hey. like? You'd yeah, like something that you folks might find helpful. I, I heard this on a, another presentation recently, and it was pretty compelling. They said, we, we, we don't assume that we know someone's name. So we don't go up to somebody and say, hey, you look like a Brian, so I'm going to call you Brian. We can think about pronouns, pronouns in the same way, just by looking at someone. We don't make that same assumption. I thought that was really helpful, and that, that can be enlightening for folks who are still trying to grapple with um, pronouns. That's great. That's great. And, and like I said, this was so very, um, not just informative, but helpful and useful. Um, I, I really like that notion of how do you see yourself so that I know how to respond and, and to reflect um, you and, and who you are and the way that you identify. This is great. Yeah, to, to that point, another great example that I came across recently in, in a more joking manner um, was uh, like generally folks trying to say that trans people aren't actually who we say it, we are. So when folks bring up like birth certificates and be like, well, yeah. your birth certificate has an F on it mm -hmm. um, and that I can respond and be like, oh, yeah, it also says like seven pounds, six ounces. So a lot has changed since then. You say right? I'm not so that like, easy. <laughs> Um, uh, that a lot of us use humor to cope with those kinds of questions, right? And so that's actually a great way to talk to folks who you think, you know, are, are not trying to do microaggressions. They just genuinely are ignorant, right? And having some of those conversations in a way that's like joking and educational. Be like, hey, like we all have the opportunity to become who we want and be our best selves, right? Um, you wouldn't say to a butterfly, like, no, you used to be a caterpillar. So I'm going to just call you a caterpillar. And again, too, thank you for the many times that I may have misgendered going through and people have politely corrected me. So thank you for that as well. Thank you. Having not anyone light up or put anything else in the chat, I guess we're, we're ready to conclude. I just want to again, thank you, um, Z and Javi, for your time today. Really, it's just been wonderful. It's wonderful having you, your delightful personalities, but then also the patience. And as you, as you signaled, the energy that it takes to explain this over and over and over again, I really just appreciate because I just, I was pitifully aware uh, and made aware in a very jolting way, as I shared with you, how, how this conversation needs to happen in many, many, many platforms. 
And unfortunately, people who don't understand fully are hesitant in having the conversation. So I appreciate the grace given, even just in being an ally, you know, at this point, that was very helpful too. But making sure that this is spoken up into the rafters and into our higher echelon of leadership who um, often have continued to make these really stunning errors in, in misgendering folks. So thank you again for your insights. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your energy. And those of you participating, we welcome you back on the first Tuesday of next month, um, where we will have one more iteration of our series. Thanks again. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.